Now, of course, comics have been translated into television heroes. Your actual Ninja Turtles, if I've got that right, is a big cult industry. Kids these days are more likely to be clutching a video than comics fresh from the newsagent. This program sees comics as part of a creative medium, an adult, almost high art entertainment. It's called The Day the Comics Grew Up. Obviously, um, comics are a medium like any other medium, a, story to, a very great storytelling medium. And um, because they started being for children, I think um, a lot of adults thought this is the only thing they could be. There's an evolution occurring in comics, which many years down the line, uh, comics will have the same stature in our culture that novels do now. The quality is incredible and much better. Um, people like Frank Miller, who did Daredevil and the new Batman, the artwork and particularly the layout and the plotting has improved incredibly. Everyone has their leading, their regular life. Uh, they have to have some kind of fantasy in it. You, um, you need a dream. Well, it's escapism, isn't it? It's probably been used a hundred times before today, the word escapism. You know, I'll definitely need that more than anything else, and that's, that's what I'll get out of it. I'd like to think that what comics can do is to provide material for a post-literate generation that still has all of the substance, all of the density and power and value of literature. Ten years ago, Judge Dredd was launched in a new British comic called 2000 AD. Dishing out instant justice with ruthless severity, he became the cult anti-hero of teenagers who have since grown up but stayed loyal. Now selling over 100,000 copies a week, 2000 AD has been joined by a new breed of mature comics which deal with issues like unemployment, urban decay and nuclear war. But vigilantes and anti-heroes like Judge Dredd operate in a crude world of good and bad, black and white, right and wrong. Can comics cope with serious issues? Can they prepare their readers for the complexities of real life? Or are they just escapist fantasies of no consequence? Tonight, Signals travels from the Orkneys to Japan, as well as the amusement arcades of London, to look at the new generation of comics, graphic novels, and computer games, and to see what impact their worldview might have on our lives. Growing up in Hoi, on the island of Hoi, which is really, you're talking about a lot of beach, you know, around an island. Um, everything that people got from, the, from there that they didn't have to pay for probably came out of the beach. Their food came out of the beach. The timbers that they put in the roofs of their houses came out of the beach. And f for somebody like me, um, the comics as well would wash ashore from the battleships. Finn, the scalp of flow, you see. Three be in the ebb tide, I, I think I referred to it once. And they were always missing their covers. You'd never tell what the name of the comic was. And usually you couldn't tell what the end of the story was. So again, I would probably have to sit there and sort of draw out my own finish to it. Jim Bakey is a leading comic strip artist living and working in his native Orkney, drawing inspiration from the environment which surrounds him. His fascination with comics has stayed with him since childhood. The, the business of pictures and words together is so powerful to me, you know? And there was a time when I felt it was fading out, you know, not fading out in me, but fading out as a, as a universally accepted means of communication. And I think it, what's happened today is that uh, the big cycle has come round, and suddenly people are interested in having the comic strip again as a, a means of communication. More and more comics are coming out with actual kind of serious statements, and it's been taken, I think it's been taken seriously. The interesting thing about it is where literature crosses cinema, you get the both, you get like the dynamism of cinema, and then you get a good read at the same thing. A lot of writers have started writing good stories as comics. Knock the doors, please.
Most people perceive comics simply as entertainment for children, which has always been a source of great frustration for many of the writers and artists. Electro Watchmen, Shadow, you name it, they're all in there. 50p jobby. In the past, mainstream comics have failed to deal with adult subjects. But this is changing, a revolution being led by the writers and artists themselves. 420, please. More mature themes have brought more mature readers. Comics, in every sense, are growing up. Oh, there you go. How long have you been drawing comics? 15 years. 15 years. Twice as long as you've been alive. Yeah. <laughs> All of those sort of fantasies that people used to have about what I would do if I was doing comics, uh, now those people are doing them. And they're getting to stretch, and, and, and the market is, is such that they can stretch, and they are being encouraged to do things that perhaps as little as 15 years ago they wouldn't have been. Writer and illustrator John Byrne has used the maturing of comics as an opportunity to update that classic hero, Superman. In the two and a half years I was working on Superman, basically I took everything that was there and just put a slight spin on it. Um, the idea was to say, the modern audience wants certain other things from the characters. They don't want their characters quite so perfect, quite so squeaky clean. But it was another comic book hero, Batman, guardian of law and order in Gotham City, who was to make the revolutionary breakthrough. In the spring of 1986, comic fans were thrilled and amazed by the publication of Frank Miller's Batman The Dark Knight Returns, a 200-page epic that elevated the comic into a graphic novel. Batman isn't a silly character anymore. Like, he's dark and broody and uh, dangerous. It was not just the scale of the piece that was so innovative and challenging. Miller had taken Bruce Wayne, alias Batman, and completely redefined the character by allowing him to age. What emerged was a man nearly 50 years old, cynical and bitter, who chose to impose his own brand of justice on what he saw to be a corrupt and decadent society. The response from the fans was immediate. They loved it. Miller had paved the way for experimentation in mainstream comics. It's just built up over the years with the advent of more adult comics has, has brought it into the fore where people that were buying them when they were kids are coming back into it now. They're seeing them and the more adult stuff like Frank Miller's Dark Knight, Elektra, Alan Moore's Watchmen and Swamp Thing. Less than a year after the release of Batman, The Dark Knight Returns, came another pioneering work, Watchmen, by writer Alan Moore and artist Dave Gibbons. Once again, the superhero convention was turned on its head. In Watchmen, set in America in 1985, superheroes have been outlawed. We deliberately set out to do a piece that was as complex, as sophisticated, and as multi-layered as the best contemporary mainstream fiction. That's not saying that it's necessarily any good, but it sure as hell is complicated. Watchmen chronicles the fall of the superheroes as, one after another, they are mysteriously killed. In parallel action, flashback and flash forward, the reader is presented with a web of visual devices and counterpoints, including a second comic story within Watchmen. I did on Watchmen was done in a specific way for a specific purpose because Watchmen was a very, very involved story calling for lots of detail, lots, lots of specific events shown in a very specific way. So therefore I adopted a very clear way of breaking the page down so that the reader didn't have to battle both with a complex layout and a complex picture structure as well. 
and for that reason I divided the pages into a three by three grid, um, which I think also has the effect of a proscenium arch in a theatre. It stays the same size and you don't notice it, and I think it also pulls you into the, into the picture and into the story more. <laughs> Since Watchmen, Moore has been acknowledged as one of the finest writers working in comics today. You start off doing a book like Watchmen, for example, aiming it at a 15-year-old comic fan. Halfway through the run, you suddenly find that it's getting literary reviews in prestigious literary magazines, and you find yourself in the main highways and byways of mainstream fiction, dressed with your underwear over your trousers and wearing a red cape. It can be quite a disorienting experience it's, as well as quite an embarrassing one. I think that now we've got the public excited, we've obviously got a duty to keep them excited, to keep pushing the medium forward. In his writing, Moore is keen to take comics out of the realm of fantasy and into the stark reality of today's world. In his first American commission for the Vigilante series, Moore wrote a story which dealt with the sexual abuse of children. Focusing on a convicted father's release from prison, the story highlights the complexity and frailty of human relationships. In the final chase, where the father is killed, the reader and all the participants are forced to look again at some of their attitudes. The illustrator for Moore's editions of The Vigilante was Jim Bakey. He's always been frustrated that stories confronting such moral issues were rare, not only for him as an artist, but also for the readers. I think that the audiences uh, for comics have always been deprived at a certain age. If you, if you speak to any Dan Dare fan, you know, who read The Eagle and I was one, one of the, the abiding frustrations is that suddenly it wasn't addressing uh, the level of maturity that we'd reached. You know, suddenly we, we had girlfriends and so on, and Dan Dare still wasn't getting organized with Miss Peabody, and we couldn't understand what the heck was going on, you know? And I think what's happened, and you know, there's a comic called 2000 AD, which is, has, in a sense, addressed this a little bit. And they've got uh, feedback from their readers to say, we want more and meatier material. And as a result of that, uh, the people who published 2000 AD have, have brought out this magazine called Crisis, which is just going straight for the jugular. Crisis has brought overtly political themes into British mainstream comics. The first story, Third World War, created by Pat Mills and Carlos Esquera, tells of five young people who are drafted to work for a multinational corporation which is exploiting people and politics in a Central American community. The second story, The New Statesman, illustrated by Jim Bakey and written by John Smith, is set in the year 2048. England has become the 51st state of America, and we're in the middle of the presidential election.
that's aimed at that kind of readership that aren't usually interested in comics, that aren't that don't want the run-of-the-mill fights, people being knocked through walls, who are looking for something with more meat, you know, something. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's serious liter literature or anything, just addresses serious contemporary issues which are, touch upon everyone's life. Crisis is, is, a, a, is a new concept which has really uh, interested me. It's interested an enormous number of people. And while I was touring uh, Britain uh, with the, the, the crew, the crisis crew as we call ourselves, or called ourselves at that time. Um, we just couldn't believe the number of people in, that, in the target age group who were asking the specific hard-seeking questions that uh, we, we have sought to address by uh, producing this magazine. I think that what comics can do, because it is an inherently sensational form, is to take these issues which may be dry, may be boring to some, and by combining words and pictures can come up with a form of narrative that will get over quite complex issues of morality, of politics, of whatever, in a form that the reader can understand. I enjoy comics. I don't enjoy reading the independent Guardian or newspapers, you know, to see, like, the view in the world. It's, well, it's my way, and everybody has their own way of feeding themselves information, television, radio, whatever. That's my way. So it's getting through to people. If they just want entertainment from comics or what, it'll get through. And I think that's why Crisis is important, because it makes a good stand and shows really good ideas and concepts of, like, political world. So it's important and it's good and it's entertaining. I think I've got a fantastic uh, position of power. I can actually change the world with this comic, whereas before I, I was just entertaining people. This time, we are actually engineering social change with this comic. It's a very new thing for me. Didn't realize I would enjoy it so much. I was involved recently in a comic called Real War, which was put together by a number of comic strip artists and writers in conjunction with an American conscientious objectors organization to actually tell people what warfare is really like, as opposed to the Sylvester Stallone model of just pouring a bottle of Mazzola oil over your pectorals and then running into battle with a blazing machine gun. We wanted to tell people what it's like when you're hit by a bullet or when someone next to you is. And we had a wonderful letter from a mother who said that her son had been very, very pro-military with no really clear idea of what that entailed. And after reading Real War, had been in a state of shock for two or three days and had really been questioning a lot of things and had eventually decided not to do it. That makes me feel good. Now, it doesn't solve all the problems in the world straight away and overnight. It would be naive to expect to. But I think that this is the only way that you can make any difference at all, by changing a person's mind here, by altering someone's opinions there. I know that works of art, even as lowly as a pop single, have made some small change in my life in the past. I see no reason to expect that comics should be excluded from that. As comics attract better writers, many of the artists, both new and established, have leapt at the opportunity to experiment with different techniques. I think you can look at comic art on two levels. You can either look at it as narrative, where it's specifically telling a story, or you can look at it as mood or atmosphere. I personally feel that, as I said earlier, if you're trying to do a complex story, you should keep the visuals fairly simple, and perhaps vice versa. I think you can make very simple things look very exciting by jazzing the visuals on it. exact and you get like you get lips and eyebrows and the stuff that you didn't get before oh. what, you see this <laughs> 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 
I think uh, eventually, and it's taken a long time, people are beginning to realise that um, comics aren't trash. Um, they've realised that in Europe for, for many, many years. They've realised it in Japan yes, for many, many years. And I think slowly in this country, people are beginning to realise that it is a, um, an accepted and bona fide art form. It never was until very recently. I think years ago, when comics were a lot more limited, if they wanted to get across a more personalized feeling or even tackle social issues or anything like that, they might eventually be driven to having to do it in a, another medium. Now, certainly, it's possible for them to do a very personalized uh, statement or uh, even a political statement. The Light and Darkness War is about the redemption of the Vietnam warrior. In writing such a story, uh, in one way you're trying to project yourself into the actual experience, and to feel the feelings, and to undergo the actual suffering, or the actual exaltation that you would experience. In Light and Darkness War, writer Tom Veach takes the experience of American soldiers in Vietnam and projects them into a fantasy world of never-ending conflict. The trouble with doing fantasy that's just sheer fantasy is you fall into cliches. Uh, everything is either Conan the Barbarian or Lord of the Rings. And when Tom Beach first sent me the proposal for Light and Darkness War, the Vietnam War background to the fantasy, I thought, made it something totally different from anything else that had been done in comics to date. Well, it was just a, a marriage of ideas between Tom Beach and myself, and we're both lurking at the back of our minds. Uh, a story, a kind of time warp story. Artist Cam Kennedy, like Jim Bakey, lives and works in Orkney. It was during a visit to the United States that he met Tom Veach. So we sort of banded around a few ideas and uh, I came back to Scotland. Just, we were in America when we were discussing this and uh, lo and behold about <laughs> Well, about five days after I came, came home, I got uh, the first synopsis from Tom, which was just the sort of story that I'd always been thinking about, but I could just never write because I'm, I'm not really a writer. Hey! <laughs> How's it, man? How are you doing? Your hair's looking good. <laughs> this is going to look pretty good with the... Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. This is great. And this is great. Oh, man. I don't believe this project would have happened without Cam. For me, seeing his art and seeing what he does with our story is one of the ways I can get in touch with the warrior spirit. Some people have described my work as being kind of gritty. Others have said it's chunky. So, I mean, take your pick. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Lazarus Jones, this is another fine mess you've got me into. I had friends who were in Vietnam and people who were hurt badly in Vietnam. And, uh, I think I felt a natural guilt because I didn't have to do that. I was at home while they were over there uh, getting killed, you know. The story in the Light and Darkness War centers on the four-man crew of a helicopter gunship which is blown up during a mission. Three of the crew are killed and pass into a fantasy universe, while the central character, Laz Jones, 
returns to America, a crippled and embittered veteran. Later, a road accident allows Jones to rejoin his comrades on their endless mythological war against evil. It all relates to a very serious thing. Can these people who have been caught in a war that, that, that left the United States divided and in a turmoil, and left a lot of the individuals returning from that war in an emotional turmoil. Can they work that out through this sort of fantasy experience? And I think underlying light and darkness war, that's definitely what Tom and Cam are really examining there. You can, you can really imagine warriors. Well, I'm thinking maybe back to the time of the Vikings and things, but you can actually imagine them coming around the, the point, the headland there, mm -hmm. you know, and finding themselves you know, just coming into what you would what you'd call a light and darkness situation. There were warriors on these islands, though, weren't there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, what yeah. Kind of I have written novels. I have published novels. Nothing happens to them. They disappear. They go out there, and you never hear about them again. People don't call you up. <laughs> you do a comic book, and uh, people start knocking at your door. You go to the comic book store, and there are people there who want to talk to you about it. Uh, you get an immediate sense of communication through doing a comic book. And the climate for doing this kind of a comic book is very uh, receptive right now. I think um, everyone has to have something outside of their day-to-day -day life. Uh, you, you work at a job, uh, you live your life, and it can be a pleasant life, it can be unpleasant. But somehow to have some sort of other world that you can occasionally uh, look to, step into, if only for uh, the length of a comic book, I think is, is a very necessary part of life. I'd like to think that what comics can do is to provide material for a post-literate generation that still has all of the substance, all of the density and power and value of literature. I think that is the challenge that is before us at the moment. If anyone doubts the potential power and influence of comics, they need only look to Japan, which has the highest readership of comics of anywhere in the world. Already, leading publishers jostle for position in the vast comic market, and their creators become millionaires. The world's top industrial nation takes the comics so seriously that it's in danger of giving up the book. Japan, it seems the comic book, known as manga, is fast becoming the universal literature. From school children to business suited commuters, every day millions of Japanese pour over the latest exploits of heroes and heroines, the likes of which are found in no other comic literature. From muscle bound Buddhist exorcists to razor sharp securities dealers, super robots built like Barbie dolls to vicious rape men attacking innocent young girls. They're a far cry from the macho superheroes so familiar to comics in the West. Japanese comic book readers range from the youngest children to the corporate elite, all avidly reading an outpouring of comic book literature. In 1987, 1 1.7 billion copies were sold, equaling the total sales for the rest of the world.
Japan is the only country in the world whose comics cater for women of all ages. They buy some 94 million comics a year. At first sight, it seems that these are packed full of stereotype Western heroines, blonde beauties whose main aim is to catch their man. But in fact, these images are used to encompass everything from the finesse of Japanese cuisine to stories of homosexual love. Japanese society has always been visually based. The written language is made up of pictorial representations. So manga have progressed without the prejudice they faced in the West. Some Japanese manga have developed complex cinematic imagery to compete with rock videos, television, and high-tech movies. Indeed, Akira the Movie is based on one of Japan's most successful comics. It has been sold around the world in several different languages. Set in Tokyo shortly after World War III, Akira the comic had definite filmic qualities. The animation movie was the most successful film in Tokyo in 1988. So, are the world sales of Akira and their like helping the rest of the world understand Japan? Or are we simply attracted by the latest version of Oriental Mystique? In America, the comic in America was published in America, and the samurai, and the people who came out of here. It was not that. In fact, it was a big part of it. ま、Certainly, the West's interest in Japan is reflected in the number of manga titles now available, but it is unlikely that they will ever include the host of sex and violence comics. With characters like Rape Man delivering exactly what he promises, to the Western observer, the Japanese censorship laws often seem loose or non-existent. The violence can be even more disturbing than the sex. Even in a manga magazine like Shonen Jump, targeted on healthy teenagers, bodies burst apart, eyeballs fly, and monster penises tear their way out from under the skin of buxom girls. Nevertheless, compared to the West, Japan is relatively free of brutal crime, and so there is a certain hypocrisy in condemning its openness. For many Japanese, manga are fast becoming a major source of information and education covering everything from classroom textbooks to governments and the stock market. Cartoonist Ishinomori has created a thousand different titles and is known for his best-selling information comic, Japan Inc. This complex analysis of the Japanese economy is fast becoming an international textbook classic. Well, え、through information comics, different subjects like economics become part of popular culture. But again, the question arises how much subtlety can be carried by speech bubbles and frames. Manga 
そうした時彼らはどうやって自分の意思を伝えるのかそれは全く文字とは異なる新しい文化がそこで生み出されるわけです。そういった新しいコミュニケーションの手段として漫画があの一,一つの役割を担うことは確実だと思います。So, a world without books? Well, the Japanese have certainly encouraged the growth of a purely visual culture. They've led the world in everything from television and video to interactive computer games. And as they become cheaper and more available, people of all ages are entering into this obsessive world of visual fantasy. Technology, originally designed for space travel and the military, is now part of the growing field known as computer leisure. It merges the lines between fantasy and reality with implications we don't yet understand. Yeah, I mean, if you can call a game where you slash the hell out of someone art, then yeah, I, I suppose you could call it a sort of art form. There has been recently a real quantum leap in the, the power capabilities of the computers in terms of graphics and, cap and sound capability. And that's, that's what's powering the market now, and that's why there's been a kind of like a rebirth of interest in computer games, because they are much, much more powerful than they used to be. <laughs> of the youth generation that are using entertainment software are that much more visually and stylistically aware than you know, sort of they have been in the past. The good games, they make you want to play more because they're so more lifelike. Shouldn't be allowed, really, should it? it? Distracts me from work. <laughs> I mean, you have to bear in mind that the games to be successful have to sell around the world now, and to get a really good top-notch, top-quality um, computer game, you, you're really talking about a team of people working on a project. Um, like people ask me for sound effects, and so I sample the sound effects and play about with it to create items like. <laughs> And also the music, I can pick and choose which tune I want to play back immediately. I don't have to root through any tapes or anything. I can just do that. When the phone rings. At the moment, it's just games, which I'm making a living at. But people like me, Jure, etc., are using exactly the same computer as me. So if I just got a bit better on the musical side, perhaps I could take a step up. You can manipulate images in a number of different ways, and the computer will do it for you, such as... You can take an image, cut areas of it out, paste them over other images. You can reduce or enlarge certain areas of the screen. and then rotate them. I shouldn't have actually done that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, computer game design and writing already is an art form in, it, in its own right. That there, there, are, there are literally hundreds of designers, just, sh just sheer designers, wor working all over the world on, on computer game graphics. They design them and draw them just like a, a designer would draw anything. And then the, the other members of the team, the programmers, convert the, those graphics and those designs, those, that, those pieces of art, into computer games. It's too fast in this time, you see it. You got similar. You're taking those out, you delete with F. Take those out. Okay. There are direct relationships between the work that I do with computer graphics and sculpture. 
I think in terms of if you're working three-dimensional, just the idea of form or um, the way that light reflects off form um, can be translated into two dimensions. And I suppose that would give me an understanding of how that, that operates by actually physically making three-dimensional objects. You know, some people have been putting on rubber masks and parading around pretending to be synthetic. This means fewer jobs for you and me, and we're going to put a stop to this right now. When I'm elected, synthetic parts will go to synthetic actors. I don't think it's anything new, what we're doing. We just do it better than most people. <laughs> During a recitation by their poet master, Grumthos the Flatulent, of his poem, Ode to a Small Lump of Green Putty I Found in My Armpit One Midsummer Morning, four of his audience died of internal hemorrhaging, and the president of the Mid-Galactic Art Snobbling Council only survived by gnawing one of his own legs off. The, the, the involvement of Douglas Adams in, uh, in adventure games was... Um... Was, 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 a, was a very good thing for computer games. I mean, Douglas Adams got involved in computer games as a, as a first, firstly as a, as a computer enthusiast, a, a games player. Um, no, I don't think it will be a one-off. I, mean, I think that um, I think the things are merging and science fiction writing and thinking and computer game thinking and design are, are quite similar. They use similar themes. I, think, I don't think that will be a one-off at all. Thus begins the odyssey of America's greatest hero, Rocket Ranger! Yeah, Soundtrack Concepts, um, they're a, uh, a publisher, a software publisher, um, and their concept basically is to um, develop games which require a lot of in-depth thinking. And one of the products they brought out recently was called Mindfighter, where you take the role of an 11-year-old boy who foresees a nuclear holocaust in Southampton, and then you wake up and your, your main task is to try and warn the world that the holocaust is going to happen and try to avoid it from happening. Red alert, red alert, red alert. You crossed my line of death. You haven't dismantled your MX stockpile. Pakistan is threatening my border. That's it, Buster. No more military aid. <laughs> Nuke them. Get them before they get you. Another quality home game from Butler Brothers. I don't think we'd really want to associate our, <laughs> um, our personalities with our games, really. play the games are more visually demanding of what we produce in terms of the fact that we're always competing with not only what is produced on the machines which we work on but more directly in what they can play when they're in amusement arcades. general they're kind of like more complex I mean in Falcon for example you're, you're there you're flying a military jet fighter and all the controls are very similar the company went to great lengths to make it as as near to the, the real thing as possible and uh, you're actually there you're, you're, fly, you're flying you're flying a jet fighter and you've got the MiGs coming at you and you're shooting them down or they're gonna shoot you down and it's it's very real it's really exciting it's good fun Uh, Sunnyvale, 
Solid. Confirming good deploy. Copy. Five, four, three, two. Mark. Uh, it's kind of funny. The, uh, when you get involved in a simulation, you kind of forget that it's a simulation. You tend to mentally think it's a real thing, and you're, you're thinking about it. Your palms start to sweat, and you get nervous, just like it was a real thing. Films like Star Wars and things like that, you know, you used to see the spaceship zipping through space, you know, and it sort of simulates that, you know, it's about as close as you can get to a flying a spaceship or an aircraft or whatever. You can lose yourself in the game, especially if you've been next door in the bar and a couple of drinks. So, uh, it's not too bad. It's a hard game to play, though. It costs you a lot of money. If we look at the way computers have developed in a reasonably short period of time, from very simple you know, sort of one to four colour computers you know, within this decade, um, through to the computers which are now going into the home, which, as I've said, ha can have over 4,000 colours on screen. If we take an exponential view of the hardware developments, in, it's only going to be a few years before we're capable of doing some really quite awesome things. I guess well, in the far flung future you will actually become a part of the game. I don't know, maybe something that's interactive. You know, it won't actually have the game which you just put on a helmet and go and fight something in a room or something. <coughs> Do you really want to play? <gasps> now we'll see who's boss. Oh yeah. <laughs> Aren't you in bed yet? I don't know.